let's talk about water. And not just anything about water. I want to talk about water's thermal properties, how it responds in the presence of heat. This is sometimes referred to as water's specific heat. Now you might think of all kinds of ways that we use water. We use water to cool things down, like the engine in your car. Water is used to cool down the engine so it doesn't overheat. And you might even think of some ways that water plays a role in natural earth systems, such as climate and weather. Which brings us to the goal of this video. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the unique thermal behaviors of water, and you should be able to predict how water will affect the heat in a system, whether that system is a natural earth system or a human-made system. To help us achieve the goal of this video, to describe the unique properties of water and how it is applied in human-made and natural Earth systems, we're going to perform a very simple experiment here. I have a digitally controlled hot plate, so it's very, very consistent in the temperature that puts out. I have a special brick here that's used to evenly distribute heat across an area, and I've marked out the area of the brick uh, that uh, we're going to use. And I have five different substances in front of me. Uh, I've got water here, I've got sand, I have some steel, I have rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol, and then I also have some wood. And what we're going to do in this little experiment is we're going to place all of these substances onto this heat source and see how they respond to the heat. How much does each one warm up as a consequence of being set on this very evenly heated surface? Now, the first thing that I'm going to do before anything else is get really accurate temperatures of each one of these substances, and I'm going to record them here in a little data table. That way, we have a baseline temperature for each substance, and we know what temperature each substance is starting at. Then, we'll place them on the hot surface and see what temperature they end with after about five minutes. So I'm going to use this very accurate digital thermometer to determine the temperature of each substance. And I should also note that I've massed each substance, so each one is approximately the same mass. They're all about 50 grams. So let me get the temperatures. All right, so I've recorded all of the starting temperatures of our substances. Uh, I've written them down here in our table. Water is 23.7, sand is 24.9, wood comes in at 24.4, steel is 25.0, and alcohol is 23.0. By the way, always record that zero at the end of the number. That zero is a significant figure. We know the number is zero. Don't just write 25 and leave it. Okay, so those are our starting temperatures. Don't worry about the fact that these starting temperatures are slightly different. What we're interested in is how these substances change in temperature once we place them on our heat source. So I have this nifty little infrared thermometer here, which is very accurate, and it's going to show us that the surface we're going to use to heat these substances is uh, very evenly heated. 107, 107.3, 105.7, 104.3, 106.9, 107.7. So that's in the neighborhood of maybe 43 degrees Celsius. We know that our surface is quite evenly heated. So I'm going to place our substances on this evenly heated surface uh, and then walk away for about five minutes and see how our substances respond to being heated. Will they all heat up at the same rate? Will some heat up faster than others? Go ahead and pause the video and take a moment to predict how will these different substances respond to this heated surface? Okay, so I'm going to place these substances on our heated surface. Here's steel, here's alcohol, here's wood, here's water, and here's sand. All right, we're going to give those about five minutes and then come back and see how their temperatures have changed. All right, it's been five minutes and I'm going to shut off our heat source 
I don't want our heat distributing brick to get any hotter while I'm trying to take these really consistent temperatures. So I'm going to go ahead and measure the temperature of each of these after about five minutes of heating. I'll write them down and then we'll look at how each one changed temperature and what that means about these substances. So here we go. I'll take each substance off and go ahead and measure it and see where we're at. All right, so that's all of them. After taking the final temperature, after five minutes of heating, this is what we get. Water's final temperature was 28.5, sand was 36.0, wood was 31.7, steel was 35.6, and alcohol was 28.9. So let me calculate each of our differences and I'll write those down too. Okay, so now that I've calculated the difference between our starting temperature and then our final temperature after about five minutes of heating, the results are kind of shocking. Here we see that water showed the smallest amount of change, less than five degrees Celsius. Next was alcohol, followed by wood, and then steel changed by almost 11 degrees Celsius. And at the top of the list was sand at a change of greater than 11 degrees Celsius. So the sand changed temperature the most, it heated up a lot, and the water changed temperature the least, it only heated up by a small amount. The fact that water changed temperature the least can't be a coincidence. It has to mean something in terms of human-made systems in which we use water, or natural earth systems where water plays some kind of a role. So by now you should have met the first goal of this video, to describe the unique thermal behaviors of water. Water doesn't change temperature very much, even when it's exposed to the same amount of heat as all these other substances. There are very few substances that can do what water does. But now what we need to do is to learn how water affects heat in a system. Here is what we know. We know that when we heat water, it doesn't change temperature as much as other substances do. All the substances were exposed to the same heat source. These substances change temperature a lot, while water changed temperature the least. Clearly water has a special relationship with heat. Why would this be? Is it because water absorbs a lot of heat? Or because water does not absorb a lot of heat? Pause the video and take a moment to decide what you think. Let's do some modeling to understand what water is up to. We will model two simple systems absorbing heat and being measured by thermometers. This setup is similar to the one we did earlier. This beaker contains water, while this beaker contains a different substance, let's say sand. Here's the heat source. For our purposes, let's assume that each substance begins at the same temperature. When we place the substances on the heat source, both absorbed the same amount of heat. The sand changed temperature by a lot, so our delta C was large. However, the water changed temperature only by a small amount, so our delta C was smaller. Let's try to understand this behavior in terms of the rate at which each substance is moving heat around. The thermometer in the sand showed a higher temperature change, meaning that the sand gave up a lot of heat to the thermometer. By the way, this is also true of the surroundings. All parts of the sand beaker would feel pretty warm. The water showed a smaller temperature change, meaning that it did not share its heat with the thermometer very well. This means that the water gave up heat slower than the sand did. Since the water was giving up heat more slowly, that means it must have absorbed more heat into itself. We can almost think of water as being selfish with heat. It doesn't want to share its heat with others. Therefore, water is good at absorbing heat. Sand and other substances are not as good at this. We have come to an important conclusion about the behavior of water when it's heated. Water absorbs a lot of heat. The ability of a substance to absorb heat is called its specific heat. Water has a high specific heat, while sand and other substances have lower specific heats. That was one of this video's goals to be able to describe the unique thermal behaviors of water. And by now, you should be able to do that. Now let's move on to the next goal of this video, to be able to predict how water will affect the heat in a system. First, let's look at some human-made systems. 
we'll learn how we can take advantage of water's high specific heat to perform important functions in these systems. Let's begin with the familiar system of an automobile with an internal combustion engine. An internal combustion engine produces a lot of heat. It generates so much heat, in fact, that without a way to actively cool it, the engine can suffer catastrophic damage. To combat this buildup of heat, cars with internal combustion engines are designed with cooling systems that use water, and these systems are called radiators. An internal combustion engine gets hot. Water is circulated around the engine and absorbs some of this heat, and the hot water is sent to the radiator. The radiator rapidly cools the water, which is then returned to the engine to continue absorbing heat. High-end electronics, such as powerful CPUs, can also generate a lot of heat. A computer with a multi-core system may have several CPUs in the same device, each of which can get pretty hot. If a CPU generates a lot of heat and has no way to get rid of it, the computer can be damaged or even set on fire. Very powerful computers sometimes have CPU coolant systems that operate on the same principle as an automobile's radiator. Cool water is fed toward the CPU. The water absorbs heat from the CPU, keeping the CPU cool. The heated water is then pumped away from the CPU and cooled. Then it's returned to the CPU to draw more heat away. You may have seen one of these before. It's called a cooling tower, and it's a component of a power generating station. Cooling towers can be found at nuclear or coal-fired power stations. Let's consider a nuclear power plant. Over here is the reactor inside a containment structure where nuclear fuel is used to generate a huge amount of heat. Water is used to draw heat away from the reactor. Some of this hot water is used to generate electricity, but that subsystem is not shown in this illustration. The hot water is pumped up into the cooling tower where it is sprinkled down like hot rain. This cools the water. The water can then be discharged into a large body of water, such as a lake, river, or ocean, and more cool water is used to continue cooling the reactor. If heat is not drawn away from the reactor containment structure, the facility can experience a meltdown, like the Three Mile Island nuclear accident in 1979, or it can even result in a chemical explosion, as it did at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine in 1986. By the way, this isn't smoke. It's moisture from the hot water. And the water discharged from the power station is not radioactive. It's just warm. A coal-fired power plant produces much more pollution in the form of smoke, carbon dioxide, and ash. For all of these human-made systems, the common element is water. Water has a high specific heat, meaning it can absorb a lot of heat and move it elsewhere. In these systems, we take advantage of this property. Water in these rules is called a coolant. But what about naturally occurring systems? You've probably experienced this one in person. Have you ever noticed that when you visit the beach during the day, there's often a strong breeze blowing against you from the water? This is not your imagination. It's a real phenomenon called a sea breeze that's driven by water's high specific heat. The beach is the boundary between land and water. For simplicity, we'll pretend that the land is made of sand, like in our experiment earlier. During the day, the sun shines on the water and the land equally. It's our heat source. But because water has a high specific heat and sand has a low specific heat, that means the land changes temperature a lot, while the water doesn't change temperature very much. This sets up a temperature imbalance. The warm land heats the air above it, which then rises. Cool air blows in off the water to fill in the vacuum. This situation, where warm land causes wind to blow toward the shore from the water, is called an onshore breeze. The opposite happens at night. Once the sun goes down, the land rapidly cools, but the water doesn't change temperature very much. Now we have the reverse of the situation we had in the daytime. Now the water is warmer than the land. As a result, the air over the water rises and cool air blows off the land to fill in the vacuum. 
this situation where a warm body of water causes wind to blow off of the land is called an offshore breeze. We can take advantage of sea breezes. Anticipating this reliable source of wind, we can strategically place wind turbines. They will experience an onshore breeze during the day and an offshore breeze during the night. This electricity can then be sent to coastal communities pretty much for free. We'll talk about one more natural system that involves water moving heat. Earth's ocean covers about 71% of the planet, and it absorbs an enormous amount of heat. Cold water flows from the poles toward the equator, where it is warmed. This warm water eventually makes its way back to the poles. This heat-driven movement of water is called thermohaline circulation. It moves a staggering amount of heat all throughout the planet. This movement of heat by water has huge implications for Earth's climate systems. This is London, England. It's at about the same latitude as Winnipeg, Manitoba. However, their climates are not similar. Winnipeg is located near the center of the North American landmass. Over the course of the year, Winnipeg sees a fairly extreme fluctuation in temperature. Their winters are cold, and their summers are quite hot. London is situated right on the Atlantic Ocean. London experiences a more moderate change in temperature. Their winters don't get very cold, and their summers don't get very hot. Why is this? Take a moment to pause the video and see if you can decide why London has a more moderate climate than Winnipeg. London has a moderate change in temperature over the course of the year because it is surrounded by water. Remember that water is excellent at absorbing heat, and as a result, it doesn't change temperature very much. Thermohaline circulation also draws warm water north from the equator all year long. This current of warm water has the effect of moderating London's temperature. Winnipeg sees such extreme temperature swings between winter and summer because it sits at the center of a landmass. Unlike London, there's no water nearby to help moderate that temperature. This is why Winnipeg's winters are so cold and their summers are so hot. The ocean's ability to absorb and transport heat affects many coastal communities on our planet. Let's revisit the goal of this video to make sure you met it. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the unique thermal behaviors of water. And you should also be able to predict how water will affect heat in a system, whether that's a natural earth system or a human-made system. If you can't do that, go back and watch the part of the video that you don't understand. Until next time, remember, you can learn anything. Thank <laughs> you.